Edmund Nielsen Woodwinds has been serving the Double Reed community for 70 years. Nielsen sells a wide variety of oboe, oboe de mort, English horn, bassoon, and contrabassoon reeds and cane, as well as reed-making accessories, reed cases, and lafrex. And of course, they have the classic Nielsen wedge knife, which features a double hollow ground with a choice of handle size. In addition, they have many other knives available. Nielsen has long been known for their large heckle bassoon vocal inventory. Fill out their online trial form to start a trial and find the perfect heckle vocal for you. For all your double reed accessories, Nielsen is ready to help you. Hey bassoonists, are you looking to ramp up your reed making? Well, Barton Kane has the solution for you. They offer over 60 variations of precision gouged, shaped, and profiled bassoon cane. Use coupon code free shipping for orders over $150. This includes international orders. Go shop now at www.bartoncane.com. Hi, I'm Galit Kaunitz. And I'm Jackie Wilson. And you're listening to Double Read Dish. A podcast for oboists, bassoonists, and the people who love them. How's it going? Great. How are you doing? I'm good. It is the end of the semester. We're on the last week over here. So are we. Oh my God, we're on the same schedule. Uh, and you've been traveling like crazy. So much. I just came back from uh, giving a master class for the BGSU Oboe Studio Bowling Green State University. And shout out to all the Bowling Green State Oboes because they were amazing. That's awesome. Friend of the podcast, Nermis Miesis. She is so wonderful. Obviously, she's such a great teacher. And it was just really fun to get to know her better. And I had such a great time. That's amazing. Yeah, it was really, really great. Well, we have a hilarious dish topic, which kind of came up organically. Yeah, I was telling you a story about something that happened to me. And you were like, wait, 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 wait. We have to put this on the podcast. <laughs> I said, you cannot be the only one. Okay, so what happened was I, um, <laughs> um, I was on the phone with a woman from New Orleans who was asking about lessons and we were just talking, getting to know each other, blah, blah, blah. And in the conversation, it sort of came up organically. She was like, oh, so I really enjoyed reading your bio on the Southern Miss website. I was like, oh, great. And she said, I did want to mention that there is a small typo on there that you might want to have them fix. And I was like, oh, what is it? I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure I can get it fixed really quickly. And she said, well, I really enjoyed reading about your work with the Eagle's Nest Food Pantry, but it seems like they left the R out of the word pantry. <laughs> So you are a big advocate of the Eagle's Nest food panty? That's correct. (laughs) (laughs) And then so I emailed the website people and he wrote back and he said, I think I fixed the underlying issue. (laughs) 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 Also, I just... It's been like that for months. Well, I have, I can see your food panty and perhaps raise you one. I had an issue with one of my PowerPoint slides for one of my classes and the intended word was public. (laughs) (laughs) There was a missing L and my college students were not quite as tasteful in letting me know about that missing letter as your um, prospective student in front, of the class. <laughs> in front of the class projected. And you know, those projections are like 12 feet big. It was big. 12 point font is like three feet tall. Oh yes. It was a big mistake. <laughs> what did 
did you do? I just went, oh, well, let's go ahead and fix that. And <laughs> put that L right on in there and tried to move on. Just tack that L on. <laughs> oh, look at that. Okay. Oh, all right. Moving on. <laughs> I also, I was thinking back to like any faux pas I might have done earlier in life. And I remember at my undergrad, I was the orchestra librarian, which also meant that I was in charge of submitting the information for the programs. And my first time doing the programs, I did denotes principal, but instead of P-A-L did P-L-E, oh, like no. the wrong kind of principal player. <laughs> And we did not catch that before it went to printing. So Wonderful. the conductor was not terribly happy with me about that. But <laughs> that is not really the funnest one. We had listeners submit oh, some God. really great ones that makes my principal mistake look like weak sauce. So we should get to those. <laughs> so we got a submission from Midori Samson, who said she's never made this mistake, but someday she hopes to write faulty rectal instead of faculty recital i have seen rectal instead of recital more times than i can count that is a very common mistake i think it's a big fear of mine that i will do that <laughs> This one I loved. Sharon says, our bass clarinetist in our reed quintet arranged some works and instead of Dolce, put Dockle. And that's how we got our name, <laughs> Dockle, reed quintet. I love that they added an accent to the E. So to make it play. <laughs> Dockle. Yes, that is making lemonade out of lemons, I think. That's awesome. Annie said, had all my recital posters made hanging them up. Then Sai forgot my oboist last name, had only his first name. Needless to say, I made new posters that looked even better and had his full name in there. Annie, I have done that <laughs> so many freaking times. I have had to reprint color 11 by 17 <laughs> posters. It's so frustrating. I feel you. And when you are on a college budget, those color 11 by 17s are no joke. That's like a precious stone, your color printing budget. <laughs> Maybe it's like past traumas like these that turned me into my type A person that I am now because I look back at some of those mistakes I made when I was younger and go, eesh, what were you thinking? Be patient with your young students. <laughs> it's even worse now because when we were in college, like Facebook had just started. Like mm -hmm. we didn't have all of the internet shaping <laughs> that, is, that could possibly happen right now. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Jenny Yang says, box works usually end in BWV numbers, not BMW. <laughs> <laughs> Then the wonderful Alex Hayashi, who teaches at Western Michigan University. Hi, Alex. I sent in a picture of a person and then he photoshopped box head on this person's head and this person is getting into a BMW. <laughs> it's pretty hilarious. In fact, I think we should share that on our social media. I'm going to. I'm totally going to. All right. Over on Instagram, Fox Double Read Products said, at a double read day, someone accidentally printed our table sign to say Fox Prod Cuts. <laughs> <laughs> Brianna writes an essay about our boy, Richard Wanger. <laughs> Wanger. Wanger. And then friend of the podcast, Claire Brazil wrote this year, I wrote multiple emails to my chamber ensemble about our plans to play the cantaloupe trio, cantaloupe. And she wrote cantaloupe. Cantaloupe. <laughs> yeah. I think somebody should write a cantaloupe trio. Dylan says, I played for my sister's wedding and the program listed Canon in D. No Canon or cameras were in sight. Misspelled Canon. A-N-N-O-N. -N -N. Yes. Misspelled <laughs> Canon. <laughs> <laughs> and then we got the most amazing submission. I, this person will remain anonymous, but they said that we could share it on the podcast. So here we go. Their student texted them about a problem with the English hoe. 
<laughs> which of course is supposed to be English horn. Bless it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, amazing. So the red squiggly underline is your friend, but it is not a cure-all. You got to proofread that stuff. Got to read it in detail. Okay, because the red squiggly line... It's not going to save you. It's going to let some things fly that are real words that we don't want on there. So double check your programs, friends. So I want to talk to you guys about Sing and Dog Double Reads. Sing and Dog Double Reads is an online double read shop and one of the largest suppliers of high quality and affordable professional and student reads for oboe and bassoon in the USA. Visit them at www.singindog.com to see all of their products and you'll be glad you did. That's Sing and Dog Double Reads. Everyone knows that Genda Industries is known for their reed knives, sharpening, and overall amazing quality and service in the double reed world. But there is so much more going on at Genda Industries. Did you know you can get oboe and bassoon reeds from Genda Industries Artisan Mall? The Genda Industries Artisan Mall is like a farmer's market filled with talented local and regional reed makers selling their reeds. It's a great way to try out some new reeds from new makers. Who knows? One day they may be your reeds for sale. Add the code DRDGENDA, all caps, no spaces, at checkout and get 10% off any Genda reed knife, maintenance kit, reed knife sharpening book, cutting block, and read tool roll. Visit them at www.gendaindustries.com. Oh, and they're more than just read knives. We are absolutely thrilled to welcome to the Double Read Dish, Benjamin Kamins, Professor of Bassoon at Rice University Shepherd School of Music. Welcome, Ben. Thank you. Thank you for having me. To begin, could you tell us how you started playing the bassoon? Oh, I've got all kinds of answers for that one, depending (laughs) upon who I'm responding to. But uh, I'll give you the one that I think is the most complete, which is uh, I started playing the bassoon when I was 12 in a beginning band class, not unlike many people. And, you know, I was there in, in, uh, se- in, I was in seventh grade and they had all those pictures of all the instruments up on the wall. And in typical 12-year-old boy fashion, it was the strangest looking one. And so I thought, what's the cool one with all the keys? And <laughs> the band director, I think, fell down on his knees and thanked God because I was the first person in five years that had wanted to play the bassoon. <laughs> so... In any case, it, it was actually funny that the, the vocal, it was an old Lesher bassoon, which your generation and the younger people don't even know what that is, but this is all pre-Fox. And they didn't have a functioning vocal. And so it took them about a month to figure out they could take some duct tape and put it around the vocals. So I had to sit there and hold the thing for a month. <laughs> but in any case, I think the really what really gets to the question at hand isn't so much how did I start playing the bassoon or how any of you started playing your instruments is it? Why did I keep playing the bassoon? Mm. And I think that, um, you know, a lot of us get exposed to, you know, different musical instruments in our case, some of the more arcane ones, but I think with any instrument, if you have it, you know, if, if, it, if it sparks your interest and you love music and you continue to play at some point, it becomes your musical voice. And, I think that's really the essence of what we're talking about here is, is that not, that not that, you know, you started playing it and, and I quit playing, you know, after a year or two, but it continued to intrigue me. And being a musician is what really has always, uh, what has intrigued me. And so it just became the way I was able to communicate. And could you walk us through your educational and training journey, who you studied with? So let's see, when I was... Um, I guess I was like still still 13. Uh, my mom, who was tremendously supportive, I, I grew up in Los Angeles, and my, my mother started asking all of the bassoon players that played in the youth orchestras around who they studied with, and practically all of them said they studied with this guy out in the San Fernando Valley named Norman Hertzberg. So uh, my mother contacted Mr. Hertzberg, and we went over to his place. I was really, I was just really young. And we met Norman. He was 50 years old at the time. This was in 1966. 
And here was this 13-year-old kid, and he says, you know, I don't usually take students of uh, that age, um, so, but I would recommend you study with my father-in-law. And, and my mom was like, your father-in-law? What is he talking about? Well, it turns out Norman's father-in-law was Simon Kovar. Mm. Oh, my God. <laughs> So you probably didn't know, but Norman's wife, Leah, was married, uh, who, you know, who's still living, and I still see whenever I go out to L.A., with Simon Kovar's older daughter, and um, elder daughter. So I, um, but my mom was determined, because nobody studied with this guy, Simon Kovar, but they all studied with this guy, Norman Hertzberg, so she was very determined, and so he tried to talk my mom out of it, but I can tell you, there was no talking my mother out of anything. (laughs) So at the age of 13, I started studying with Norman Hertzberg. And I was very well suited to studying with him because he had about as much patience as my dad, which wasn't a lot. And so I, I, I had learned through my whole childhood how to listen really closely and to not be asked to do things more than once. Because my dad loved to tell you how to do it one time. And after that, he didn't have much patience. So in any case, I, uh, I started studying with Norman at a very early age. And he was, except for a couple of summers, he was my only bassoon teacher after my first teacher, who was a, a local player in Los Angeles. But I was 13 when I started studying with Norman. He was my only teacher. I went to the University of Southern California for two years, and I got a job in the Minnesota Orchestra when I was 19. And so I don't have much more formal education to talk to you about, other than I have been a lifelong learner, and I'm a curious person. When we have people who studied with these like legendary figures, like Norman Hertzberg, we always love to ask them, what were lessons with him like? What was he like? Uh, for me, lessons with him were, I think, quite different than they were for people later on. But I love telling this one story. So when I was in the uh, when I was in Houston, my last nine years in the Houston Symphony, I was incredibly fortunate to have uh, the woman who played second bassoon was a spectacular bassoonist, musician, human being named Karen Pearson, who is now the professor of bassoon at Ohio State University. And we were sitting in rehearsal, and Carrie said to me, I don't remember Mr. Hertzberg talking very much in lessons. And it's typical, we were just basically sitting there, that she would have blurted that one out just like that. <laughs> she says, do you remember him talking very much in lessons? And I said, no, that's funny. I, I, I don't either. So I called Norman up. Is he was not, he was obviously, if I called him up, he was obviously still alive at the time. And, uh, I said, Carrie and I don't remember you talking very much in lessons. How come? And he said, well, you and Carrie picked up on the program pretty quickly, so I didn't feel the need. To, you know, he had a curriculum. He, he had a very, very uh, specific curriculum, and he, liked, he, he went through it very systematically. So he, his belief was that the curriculum did much of the teaching. But he says there were, te- there were students that I, taught, uh, that, that I talked quite a bit more with, but – he said, do you remember when you were in high school, I always said to you, when you're ready for a lesson, call me up and we'll set it up. And I say, yeah, I remember that. But I thought that's because you were working in the studios and your schedule was very unstable from week to week. And he said, that was part of it. But the real thing, part of it was, is that I wanted you to know what the word prepared meant. Hmm. And I think from a very early age, he taught me what it meant to not attend anything with my bassoon where I was not prepared to play it well. It does, that does not mean play it perfectly. It just means play it well. So I think that that was an essential element of what my lessons with him were like. He has a very specific curriculum. He, it was divided. He taught a great deal from etudes, and it was divided into what he called the technical side, and then the other were the mu- more musical side. And the technical, we'd go through the Mildy scale and chord studies twice. And then you went on to the 90 studies of PR, which you would do books one and two, and you had to learn them every one every week up to the metronome marking that was in the book, and you had to play it with the metronome. Mm. So the point is, is that you, you had to figure out in a short period of time how to prepare something that was extremely technically involved and with up to the metronome marking. So there was, there was a goal, a real goal at a, that you had to attain and you had to figure out how to do it. And then the musical studies, you started with the Orifici melodic studies, and then you went to the Jacobi caprices to the Jean Corps, 26 melodic studies, Gambaro, 
uh, and the and most, I think most, and it goes on from there, but I think the most important element of Norman's teaching of, which is notable, of melodic and interpretive etudes was the very last ones you would do would be the multi concert studies instead of the only ones, which I see from a lot of students. Mm-hmm. And his f- feeling about that, and, and I, I agree with this to a certain extent, is that they're too hard for people until they're really ready from a technical and a musical maturity to be able to play them. And I think that routinely they are given to students when they are not prepared. They're just simply not ready to play them. Mm-hmm. They're too young. They're not musically sophisticated. They do not have the technical capabilities to play them. And so they play them poorly. It's like giving the Weber concerto to a 12 year old, mm-hmm. which we see all the time. You know, is it as hard? It, can they play? Cause it's a bunch of F major scales. Well, kind of sort of, but are they getting the essence of Weber style? Are they getting, you know, the musical elements of the piece? Clearly not. Right. So I think those are some of the things that were indicative of my lessons with Norman Hertzberg. He was exacting. He was, uh, a, he was not an easy man. Uh, I was used to that. But you have to remember, he was born in uh, 1916. He was the generation that had grown up with the Depression. They'd grown up with the Second World War. They had a very clear idea of what right and wrong meant and saw the world in stark terms like that. It's just quite different than the way we tend to see the world. Once you won the associate principal bassoon with the Minnesota Orchestra job, you said you were 19. I was. What was that like, winning such a huge (laughs) job as a teenager? And what was that? Was there a big learning curve? And and what did you learn about playing principal or associate principal that became important to you in your career? Well, you know, the expression is hire a teenager while they're the smartest that they're ever going to be. Because, you know, because when you're a teenager, you're so you're so inexperienced, you think you know everything. Sure. Which I yeah. think brings up, I think, what, one of my greatest liabilities and one of my greatest assets simultaneously was my unflagging belief in my own abilities. And it, mostly, I have to say, and I mean this, I, I think it was a great liability in that it didn't keep me open to listening to other people when I should have But at the same time, I just, you know, was sort of blindly confident. The biggest issues for me were not playing the bassoon at that point. I mean, I'm not saying I sounded great, but I thought I did, which, of course, you know, thinking you do is half of the the issue. I think Mm -hmm. some of my biggest issues were much more uh, being 19 years old and being lonely and being with a group of people, most of whom had families. I think the next youngest person was 25. And there's a big difference between being 25 and being 19. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think that was the hardest part for me. Believe me, I'm, I, I, I'm not, you know, people are always so impressed because I got this job when I was young. I was lucky. I, you know, I, I won a job when I was young. It was a blessing and a curse. But I don't look back at it at this point. And what did I learn? I learned pretty quickly to be prepared when you come to, when you, when you show up at work, you better know the music pretty well. I did a lot of really stupid things. I showed up for things in a way of lack of preparation that I never would now, ever would now. But it was also a different time. You know, this people your generation and the students that I'm teaching now, you're not cut any slack. You, you know, you're expected to know the entire repertoire and to play it as if you've been in the, in the job for 15 or 20 years. When I, when I got that job, you know, if you messed up a little bit, they, they, they gave you more opportunity to learn. Mm. So I, I, I gradually, I, I, I figured it out. I think I really started to really figure it out when I got to be about 25, because I think that's when enough synapses actually connected that I was not a (laughs) child, not just an idiot child anymore, you know. But I think one of the most important things, which I had learned early on, which got me through it, is I learned early on that talent stops being meaning anything when you get to be about 18. And at about 18, boy, you better start really buckling down and start working, because I'll tell you something. I was young, but people catch up. And the thing that really kept me going was is that I really learned the meaning of practice and of working hard, and I continue to do it and continue to now, and I'm not 19 anymore. And I think that the more talented part of the expression, it's a word I don't really like to use a whole lot. I don't believe there, that anybody is untalented, and I don't believe there are any natural players. You know, People always talk about so-and-so. He's a natural. I think it's BS. That person's worked hard. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But I think one of the most import, important things is learning, is learning uh, to just do the work. And the more talented you are, 
the harder you have to work. And I've worked hard and still practice. So could you walk us through your professional journey of getting to where you are today from the Minnesota Orchestra? Sure. I was in the Minnesota Orchestra. I wanted to get out of there really badly. I wanted to I wanted to get a principal bassoon job, and I took a lot of auditions, and I didn't win any. And then I kept working hard. Like I told you, at the, about the age of 25, I really started to get a, gain a deeper grasp of what was going on. And then, let's see, I was... I guess I was 27. Towards the end of my 27th year, I auditioned for the New York Philharmonic, and I was the runner-up when Judy got the job. Mm. It was disappointing. But right after that, I was asked to come and audition for the Houston Symphony, which I did. And uh, I got that job, which I held for 22 years. Then I, 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 started, I was living my life kind of like I was always going to get, you know, this was the stepping stone to the big time, whatever the hell that was. And uh, then I auditioned, I think, in the 80s and uh, for the Boston Symphony, which I didn't get. And I think it was around that time after Richard got the job in Boston that I began to realize, you know, it's starting to look like you're going to be living in Houston for a while. And I decided that I would really commit myself to this community. And I had started teaching at Rice in 1987, adjunct. And uh, I would say between 19, between. 19, that time, and for about the next 10 or 12 years, my, my interest in teaching became greater and greater. I can certainly say my interest in playing did not diminish at all. But I'm a pretty, um, I'm, a, I'm, I'm an outspoken person, and I tend to have a, see the world in highly ironic terms, which is not always the best thing, way to be when you are in a symphony orchestra. Because you sit there and something happens in the orchestra, you say to yourself, can you believe that just happened? I mean, that's just like theater of the absurd, you know, and I probably didn't keep my mouth shut enough because, you know, really strange stuff would happen. And I, you know, I just was marginally inappropriate for playing in a symphony orchestra temperamentally. But I got more and more, that's an aside. So I got more and more involved with my teaching. And I, and I said to my wife that uh, I said, you know, I'm really thinking about maybe I, leave the orchestra and get to take a teaching job. And I said, but I don't want to teach any place but Rice. You know, and I could make this a longer story, but basically they, they offered me a full-time professorship, tenured professorship at Rice University after having taught there for, oh, 15 years. And by that point, you know, I had a pretty, I, you know, a lot of my students were working and so things were going well. And so I just decided I was 50 years old. I decided, you know, I've been playing in orchestras for 31 years, you know, it's, maybe it's time to go do something different. And so uh, I took this job teaching, it, uh, being the bassoon professor full time, and I left the orchestra. And so I don't play an orchestra very much anymore, but I do a lot of solo and, uh, well, I don't know if it's a lot, but I do a lot of, my, it's my, my playing career is more chamber and uh, solo oriented. You mentioned always looking for the next thing, that next audition, that next job opportunity. And eventually coming to a realization that maybe you would stay put for a while. We have this a lot in music, I think, where people are not satisfied with the job that they have, the position that they have, uh, the city that they're living in. And what advice could you give those people who are still looking for the next best thing? Is it settling? Is it something that they should try to do? It's a big topic, I think, in uh, the music community right now. Well, there's an expression which you've probably heard no short of 5,000 times, which is you must learn to bloom where planted. Mm. On the other hand, while you still have the fire in the belly and you still have the dream, I am a strong believer that you should keep going and working towards that dream. Now, I didn't give up on my dream. My dream changed. Mm. I'll tell you something that I've told this to many people and they usually can't believe me, but until I was into my forties, I thought I was a failure in my profession. They said, are you kidding? You know, you're principal bassoon of the Houston symphony, you know, you, you know, you teach at Rice university you know, you've got all this great stuff, you know, you've got a wonderful wife and child and all that stuff, which was all true. But until I, you have to remember, I got a job as the associate principal bassoonist of the Minnesota Orchestra when I was 19. Well, that obviously means that you're going to be principal of the God Philharmonic when you're 21. 
<laughs> and I never won the job as principal of the God Philharmonic, you know? Right. No one, you know, that wasn't, that's, you know, that's not where, my, where things went. And so for a long time, I thought because I didn't win that job, I thought I was a failure. But I started to, I finally came to realize that that was an absurdity. And it, it comes down to something which I say to people often, which is, is that if you want to stop judging yourself, you have to stop judging other people. Mm-hmm. And you have to stop, and vice versa. And I think letting go of judging people has been one of the most important things that I have done for myself. Now, people say, well, that's ridiculous because you sit in a room and you're judging people all the time about their playing. And the answer is, no, I'm not. I'm not judging them. I might be the most discerning person in the room when it comes to listening to some other bassoonist or somebody, but I'm certainly the least judgmental person in that room. And I think that's a really, really important thing in terms of finding where you should be. Find out what you really is important. I'm given the incredible opportunity to work with some of the most talented, pardon the expression, brilliant, lovely young people that are out there. I mean, who could be luckier than that? I just don't know. I feel I have the best job in the country now. And I'll tell you a funny story. I was at, up at Music Academy. I teach at Music Academy of the West in the summertime. And one of my colleagues there uh, is Jonathan Feldman, who is married to Judy LeClaire. And I had Jonathan and Judy. Judy and I are good friends at this point with Jonathan and my wife. And had, had Jonathan and Judy at the house for dinner. And this is soon after I'd left the symphony. And I was, and she says, well, what's your job like? And I tell her about my job. And she looks at me with longing in her eyes and says, you have your weekends free? (laughs) And I'm thinking, wait a minute. That was the job that I thought I had been a total failure for, for not getting. And she's looking at me longingly. Mm -hmm. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't think Judy is at all sorry that she's, things turned out the way they do. I'm not saying that. I'm saying this, that she, she saw something of what I had that was different than what she had that was was desirable. That's all I'm saying. And I think that helps put things in perspective is, is what we have. Absolutely. That's a lot to reflect on. Definitely. I'd love to ask you several questions actually about your career as a pedagogue, because indisputably you have had immense success. Your students have had immense success. As you said, many of them are working in some of the best jobs in the country in some cases. And uh, I guess my first question would be, given that you have more young bassoonists desiring to study with you and be a part of your studio than you can realistically take on, what characteristics do you look for when listening to auditions to select who you would like to work with? I think every one of us is a function, our our teaching is a function of the place where we teach. I have a 30 year plus relationship with the Shepherd School of Music. And I strongly feel that what I do at Rice is very much part of a team. I am beyond fortunate to teach in a school that has, as far as I'm concerned, the finest college orchestra conductor in the known universe. And that's Larry Ratcliffe. There's nobody that I know of anywhere that can work with a group of young people in an orchestra like Larry. That contributes mightily to my program. I am fortunate with my other woodwind colleagues, Bob Atherholt, who I played with for years in the Houston Symphony is the oboe professor, Richie Hawley, and Leon Baisi. I mean, these are people with credentials beyond, uh, you know, that, that are A+. Plus. And we all work together. And the faculty at the Shepherd School works together. We do chair chamber music, and we talk about each other, students with each other. We're always supporting each other. So I, could, I uh, assign much of it to the fact of these, this collaborative nature of the place in which I teach, if you took me and you put me in another school, would things be going the way they've gone with a lot of my students, you know, get jobs? I don't know. I think I've got a pretty good system for teaching, but, and I think it, you know, and I've intentionally kept it kind of middle of the road so that it works for a lot of people. Cause I'm not trying to get everybody to sound the same. 
you know, I don't make reads in a particularly um, idiosyncratic way. And you just try to help people to play cleanly and have a good musical sense and, and make a good bassoon read because it's really hard to play the bassoon without that. Um, I mean, I can talk to, and we'll probably talk more about my curriculum, which I'm happy to talk about, which might be part of the question that you've just asked. Yes, please. So I use what I would say a kind of modified version of Norman's curriculum in that when an undergrad comes in, we go through the Milde scale and chord studies twice. And I think that's a good idea because they do it one time and they're slugging through it. And usually by the time I see them, they've gone through it, what, you know, before. But they, you make it clear what even playing is because one of the things that I'm really working for in, say, the Milde scale and chord studies or in the uh, my curriculum of fundamentals is uniformity. And here's one of the great paradoxes is I, I teach them to play with great uniformity. In other words, being able to play a scale rhythmically and tonally very even with great intonation so that when they are playing music, when they choose to not play with great uniformity, they are in control of it. Mm -hmm. So the irony is, is that we're playing, we're, we're working towards uniformity of execution so that when we choose to play without uniformity, but with expression, you are in control of the instrument well enough so that that expression comes across clearly to your audience. Does that paradox make sense to you? Mm -hmm. Okay. I just, that's very important because that's a very important part of my teaching and that's why I'm mentioning it. So in order to do that, all my students have a weekly lesson, private lesson, and we have a fundamentals class every week. And in that fundamentals class, they all have to play scales for each other in front of each other. Now, you know, I can insist that they practice scales, and I do, and at every lesson, it starts like this. So did you do a scale today? And they say to me, yes, I did. I say, which scale did you did? <laughs> and they say, I did, and you fill in the blank. I said, okay, well, let's listen to a little of that. So they play the scale, and I just listen, and, and you know, try to usually make one comment that maybe will be helpful. You know, just, you know, hey, you know, it sounds like the notes are getting a little long on top on the, on, on the high register. You know, something little like that. And then we move on to the other stuff in the lesson. Or if I go in and they say, did you do a scale today? And they say, no, I didn't. I will say, well, if you had done one, which one would you have done? And I'll say, well, I would have done B flat major, whatever. I said, well, let's hear it. So the next week they come in and if they say, hey, did you do a scale today? And they'd say, no, I didn't. And then I'm going to say, I think maybe you better go into a practice room and do a scale and we can have another lesson next week. So I make it very clear that this is not just uh, something I'm, I'm going to just trust you to do because you know, I'll tell you, if you trust your students to practice their scales, they won't. And in addition to that, they have to play them in front of each other, which is even more, you know, you, the look on everybody's first scales class, <laughs> when you ask them to play a scale in front of everybody is there is they're like, oh my God, I'm really going to have to do this. They get used to it pretty quickly. But I'll tell you, they come in with the read that can work and they've practiced that scale. And that's all I'm looking for. It's not that it's perfect. I just want them to be, know what, be prepared for the circumstance that they know is there. And we have a studio class in addition to that. And at the beginning, I would say up through much of the first semester, we do it on reads, read finishing, read construction is done in class. And I do a day one scrape, I don't know how many times a semester or in a year. I don't know. I just innumerable times to show them how to make a bassoon read. It takes tremendous patience to teach somebody how to make a bassoon read. So one of the things that I do that I think is important is that we have uh, gouging machines at the studio so that they can gouge their own cane. Now, first of all, that's good because I think splitting your own cane is good in, in terms of being able to split it in the right places on a tube. But the other thing is, and I'll, I'll ask you both, Jackie, I'll ask you this question. How much does a stick of, of, of straight gouge cane cost? Straight gouge cane, how much does that cost? Three bucks? Somewhere around there, yeah, probably three, four bucks. Three, four bucks, okay. So let me ask you another question. How many of those pieces of cane is going to be good? How many good reads do you get? And the answer for me is uh, maybe one out of six will be a decent read. And my reads, my students have to make six, they, I ask them to make six reads a week. 
so that we have something to talk about in the lesson. It doesn't mean any of them. Sometimes none of those are any good. But if you were paying $4 for a stick of cane, how quickly would you throw it away? Last time I checked, students don't have any money. Right. You wouldn't throw it away. But if you're, if you're gouging your own cane, it costs you, what, between about 50 cents? And I'll tell you, people are much more apt to throw something away that costs them 50 cents than they are to throw something away that costs them four bucks. Mm -hmm. I, that's how I approach that, is you've got to have the machine there so that they're willing to do that. So because if you go to an audition, all things being equal, which they are not, the first person with the best read is going to win the job. Mm -hmm. So that's a controllable criteria, more or less. If you make, I think it's safe to say, if you sit down, you got an audition coming up, you make 25 reads, you're going to have a decent read. Fair enough? I would hope so. I would hope so too. <laughs> and you know what? Maybe you couldn't make one read and have a decent read, but I'd say your odds are not as good. Mm -hmm. And I say all things being equal, they're not. So you might as well let go of that one. That's an uncontrollable criteria. But having a good read is controllable to a certain extent. Now, the problem is, of course, to learn to make a good read is you have to make, a, you know, what? Thousands? I don't mm -hmm. know. Lots. So that's why I make them make six reads. I make, you know, you have to come into every lesson with a new, with a new read that works. Or at least that if we look at it, we work on it, we can get it to work. I don't expect somebody to, to finish a read beautifully when they first walk in. That's silly. That's what they came to me for. But, uh, but you got to make, you, you, I don't know, another way of playing the bassoon eff as relatively effortlessly with a crappy read. You're always then, you're always like, have, you're always accommodating what you're doing to the read too much. Mm -hmm. You have to accommodate to the read, but it shouldn't be that much. So what happens? You don't have much of a dynamic range. You have no variation in your qualities of articulation. You can't taper notes. They just stop on you. You have a crappy sound, you know. So one of the things people that Norman always used to say, you make your reads for response and intonation. And people misunderstand that when they think they thought Norman Hertzberg didn't care about tone. Well, that's stupid. Of course he cared about tone wasn't an idiot. And people say, you know, I'll go to students and I'll say, you make your reads for response and intonation because that's the only way you're going to get a read that has a good tone. Mm -hmm. Hmm. It's not a question of that. It's that's how you're going to get it. You know, I'm not telling you to sound bad. I'm not an idiot. <laughs> 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 you know, I mean, really. Yeah, but it's not like, I don't want you to sound like me either. I want you to sound like you. Which gets to the essence of what it, the, that, I, you know, you, you asked me, so why do my students do so well? The answer is, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but I do know this. This is that I encourage them. I implore them to find their honest, personal voice on the instrument and recognize beauty in that and run with that. Because what you're trying to do when you're at an audition at a concert, I don't care where it is, you're trying to communicate with people. And if you're trying to sound like your teacher, you're not going to communicate. If you're trying to imitate somebody else, if you're trying to get it right, there's no right. As I often say, there's no there there because if there was a there there, I'd be there by now. <laughs> I've been doing this long enough. <laughs> I'm still trying to get there, wherever there is, because it's not there. Anyway, you know what I'm saying. And, and that's what we're looking for. So I'll hear somebody, I'll, I'll hear somebody will come in and they start to play for me. And I can tell their teacher has told them that they play too loud or their teachers told them they play too soft or their teachers told them they play too bright or their teachers, they take too soul. They do too much, too little, too something. And so they come in and they're trying to, and they play cautiously, just super cautiously. And it basically, it sounds completely uncommunicative. So I say, let's okay, let's play a game. Let's imagine you're in, you're, 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 you're in bed, you've just wake, woken up, and there magically, a bassoon is next to the bed with a soaked reed on it. And you know, you barely have woken up and you reach over and you grab that bassoon and you just play an F major scale. So I, I do that. I have them just reach over and say, now just play an F major scale like you just got out of bed and you're just putting air through the horn. Okay, invariably, their tone is more vibrant it is freer. It is more personally emotional than when they were trying to imitate somebody else. Mm. They play mm -hmm. that. I say, what did you hear? And they tell me what they heard. I said, that is your honest, true voice on the bassoon. Now, that's not what you should sound like all the time, but that's what you need to build off of. And most people find this 
extremely freeing. Mm. And it's not that easy to get them to do it on a more consistent basis, you know, to play with that freedom, with that lack of, again, this is a lack of judgment. It's not a lack of discernment. I'm not trying to get you to play in a way that doesn't sound good. And I, I, and if I hear somebody playing in a way that I think is outside of the norm of what is, mm, I'm going to use a word and I hate this word. Okay. But I think you'll understand marketable. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think that I, that's, again, I don't like the word, but you understand what I'm saying. Yes, Mm -hmm. definitely. I will, I will say, you know, I don't think that's going to work. And I think we need to look at, you know, this or that to try to, so, uh, but, but, you know, I have a pretty wide latitude for that. You know, I'm not, uh, I'm not too judgmental about stuff like that. I'd love to ask you about cultivating potential. Uh, I hope it's not too abstract. And I know that some of the success, quote unquote, that people are able to achieve is which jobs open up when. Sure. But I wonder if when you look over the history of the students who have achieved remarkable success, if there are any common characteristics or approaches that they exhibited and when you identify a student who has immense potential, how you as a pedagogue and mentor go about helping them capitalize on it. You do the work. You practice your scales every day. You practice your long tones. You do your middle scale and chord studies, and then you go on to these next etudes. You do the work. You play them at a very high level. I help them to realize when it's not clean. It has to be clean. It has to be in tune. It does not have to be perfect. It just has to exhibit an understanding of what I'm talking about. I have a sign up in my studio that says, before enlightenment, chop wood and carry water. After enlightenment, chop wood and carry water. Mm -hmm. You just do the work. And you do the work from the through your whole play in life until you decide you're going to hang the thing up. I practice my scales every day. Now, do I do it exactly the same way every day? No, you have to keep it interesting. So I have, you know, I teach the, I teach uh, scales the way Norman taught them to me, you know, more pretty much, but you know, you, I sometimes will start them in the middle. In other words, instead of on a low beat flat, I'll start it on the C and nines above it. I'll go up to the D natural and nines above that. Then I'll go back to the C and then I'll, I'll build it out sideways, continuing to go higher and lower as I repeat the scale out from the middle. Instead of always thinking of a scale as being from the bottom to the top to the bottom. Or I'll do different articulations. If I have a student who has studied with me for a long time and they come in and they're, they've, I know they've practiced their eight articulations. I'll say, okay, play the ninth articulation. And they look at me like I'm crazy, which I get that look a lot anyway. <laughs> like I'm crazy. And I say, go ahead, figure out another articulation. So they have to. Maybe they'll, maybe they'll do it in groups of five. Maybe they'll tongue four and then and slur four. Maybe they'll, I don't care what they do. Just use your imagination and come up with a way that's different than what you've always done that intrigues you. But do it evenly, do it in tune. And evenly means evenly rhythmically and evenly. It's the uniformity I was talking about so that you will have the control over your instrument and yourself so that you can play without uniformity when the music calls for it, which is all the time. Because music is living and breathing. It's not about playing like a machine, except when it's some piece that it's meant to sound like it's a machine. We do have pieces like that, but that's just another type of expression. You know, one of the pieces that was out on Meg Quigley, for example, is that, uh, you know, the the Tonsman Suite, Mm -hmm. you guys remember, you know, the Tonsman Suite, you know, and the last movement is, it's very mechanical. It's supposed to be played mechanically. That's the point. That's what the composer called for. Okay, there, you know, then you don't have, you, you're playing with tremendous rhythmic precision right in the middle of the beat, blah, blah, blah. You know what I'm talking about. Uh, that's what 
I have my students do. I prepare my students as well as I possibly can for, an, for auditions. But they're the one that have to do the work. And as soon as they head off to that audition, I let go of it completely. Mm. I let go of it completely. And I'll tell you something. If somebody wins second bassoon in the East, West, Northern, you know, Scabba Symphony, <laughs> or somebody wins principal bassoon of the Metropolitan Opera, I say to them, congratulations, I'm very proud of you. Mm-hmm. Because I don't care what job it is. You win an audition, that's a big deal. Mm-hmm. It's not a bigger deal to win the Met or to win the Philharmonic than to win second in wherever. You understand what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. And I'll tell you something that has been very striking to me over the years, and that is whether you're in the, and this is arbitrary that I threw this one up, whether you play in the Omaha Symphony or whether you play in the Boston Symphony, you're not any less dedicated to your job in Omaha than you are in Boston. And I'll tell you, some of the people I've met in Omaha or orchestras like that have been more dedicated to their job than some of these other places. That's an individual thing. It's not based on the fact that your job pays a lot of money. Mm-hmm. And it's probably a better orchestra because it's what you bring to the table. That's really, that's beautiful. Yeah, <laughs> it's really edifying. So if you have, you obviously perform at an incredibly high level, the highest level, and you have students who perform at the highest level. Um, have you ever had to deal with performance anxiety or nerves or anything that might topple you from your game that is maybe related, maybe unrelated to the level of preparation? And what advice do you have for people out there who are dealing with the same thing? Everybody gets nervous. And if anyone tells you they don't get nervous, they're either 14 years old or they're, li- <laughs> or they're lying. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and when I when a fourteen year old, you know, I teach it, you know, I teach it that the bassoon um, symposium up at Interlock, and occasionally I'll come across like a really young kid. They say, "I don't get nervous." I say, "Fantastic!" That's all I said. That's just fabulous. <laughs> I don't tell them that they're going to learn about that when they gain greater self awareness. Look, so everybody gets nervous. If the real question is not. You're never going to make it so you don't get nervous, and you're never going to be able to predict when you get nervous. The question is, is that how do you how do you deal with it? How do you deal with being nervous? And the way I've dealt for myself that has worked well for me, and I'm going to tell you, I get ner- I get plenty nervous all the time. Is uh, with my work with the Alexander Technique. Mm. We haven't talked about this at all, but in addition to this, I am I am a certified teacher of the Alexander Technique, and let me tell you something. That was a big deal getting that. That was a four year training program. Wow. Uh, and what you learn is by practicing it, by practicing, and just like anything else, if the, like practicing the bassoon, you have to practice this, you can gain a conscious control of some of your unnecessary tension that you hold in your body. Now, you notice I did not say you can gain a conscious control of all the unnecessary tension you have in your body because that would be silly. You're just working on it. It's a practice. Playing the bassoon is a practice. Being a doctor is a, you hear doctors talking about the practice of medicine. Mm -hmm. That's any activity that you work towards the unattainable goal for your whole life that you choose to spend towards that activity. And whether you practice yoga, whether you practice meditation, mindfulness, the Alexander Technique, Any of these things like this, you're just working at making little cracks in the armor of this. But those little things do help. And so you have, you know, I mean, I could talk for hours and hours about this one. But the point being is find something that helps you get to get control of your emotional, your mind-body state your combined mind's body state. It's breathing exercises, again, yoga, meditation, Alexander technique. These things are very helpful, but find the one that works for you. And because people always say, so what's the best form of exercise? And you know, this is a classic answer. The best form of exercise is the one that you're willing to do. Mm -hmm. 
And I, and I just happen to really believe that. So this one works for me. Do I go up to everybody I meet and I say, listen, you've got to do what works for me. You've got to do the Alexander technique. No, I don't do that. But I will say, I will say to people, I think that finding something, and it can be running. A lot of people love to run. People love to swim. There's all kinds of things that calm people down. And the residual effect, the practice of what that does to your whole mind, body, self, does stay with you. If at any time you were able to have some sort of control over your mind, body state, you can do it again. Whenever you finish an Alexander lesson, somebody says, I feel great. How can I feel like this all the time? Or I'll never be able to feel like this ever again. I say, you felt that way once, you'll be able to feel that way again. But it takes practice. Everybody wants the magic feather, but that's not out there. Hmm. It takes work. Just do the work. <laughs> <laughs> You know, how much do you want it? Yeah. You know, I went to this incredible class. So do you know who Don Sinta is? Don was the saxophone teacher at the University of Michigan for many years. He said, this guy, this is in his 80s. And I went to this class years and years ago, before either of you were born, that Don gave. And he said, if I told you, this, remember, this was probably 1980-something, okay? 80, uh, you know, early 80s. And Don said, if I told you that at the end of six months, I would give you a million dollars. This is when a million dollars was more money than it is now. It's, still a, lot, it's a lot of money. But anyway, I'd give you a million dollars if you could articulate 16th notes at quarter equals 250. I'll give you a million dollars if in six months you can do that. You'd figure out a way of doing it. You know, And the, his point, obviously, was if the motivation is strong enough, you'll figure it out. Mm-hmm. So, so here, I tell my students this all the time, and they all know this. I have a very slow single tongue. And I came from a generation before everybody double tongued. But I wanted to be a professional musician. And I knew that being able to single tongue at a hundred, you know, 16th notes at a hundred was not going to get me there. So when I was about 15, I taught myself how to double tongue because no one, no one double tongue back then. Back then, if you had to double tongue, you thought it was a crutch. It was a stigma was attached. Interesting. And so I taught myself to double tank and couldn't tell anybody about it because it was a weakness. Mm. But I've learned to double tongue well enough to have had a good career. And I've worked very hard at it. And to this day, I practice my single tongue every day. Because damn it, I'm going to get it faster. <laughs> Knowing full well I'm not. But I think <laughs> this. I figured this one, and that is some people have always ask me, can you take your great, can you take your weaknesses and turn them into strengths? And I said, so here, let me ask you this question. I can't single tongue fast and I'll never be able to single tongue fast, but I've worked so hard on it that I have a really nice quality of single tongue up until to a certain speed. Now, did I take my liability and turn it into an asset? No, but I took the, fa the, the thing that it was about and made sure that what I could do, I could do really well. Mm -hmm. so it's not exactly an asset but I think that's really important and I made sure that there was no gap between my single and my double tongue and I made sure that I can double tongue in a way that you can't tell and I think that's the point I wanted it so badly I taught myself to do something that there was a negative stigma attached to because otherwise I was never going to have it could you perhaps tell us about a favorite memory of a past performance that you have? Yeah, I remember playing the Atlas Sonata at, at, at uh, the IDRS conference in 1978 when I was young. And I was just a kid, and it went really well. And I was so pleased. I really was in the zone when I played it. And I just remember doing that at an IDRS conference. I've got a lot of memories of a lot of concerts. But I think it brings up a much more important issue, which is when you're young and students tend to do this, they see concerts as events. I don't see concerts as events anymore. I see them as part of a whole. Mm. Because if you see a concert as an event, if you have a bad concert, then you must be a bad player. But if you just see it as one point along a whole continuum, it doesn't upset you in the same way. And I can tell you 
with having given thousands of concerts, that's all it really is. Uh, you have to work at that one, but I think that's, I think really important instead of, you know, remembering, I mean, I, you know, I've got wonderful memories of playing the Schoenberg Quintet in Vienna. I've got wonderful memories of, you know, beautiful concerts, many beautiful concerts. You remember the really good ones. You remember the really bad ones. You know? <laughs> You know, it's the other ones that just kind of get caught in the, in the middle there somewhere. <laughs> but I'll tell you this. Uh, don't try to, don't think you're going to work really hard and it's ever going to be comfortable. If you want to get be comfortable, go do something else with your life. This is not for comfort. This is, this is, this is interpretive. An interp- for us as non-composers, which most of what we do is not, uh, you know, I mean, you might be a composer. I, I don't know. But the act of interpretation or of creation is not inherently comfortable. What is some advice that you would give to a younger version of yourself? And similarly, what would advice would you give for a young musician who aspires to have a career like yours? Well, I'm going to answer the first one. My father taught me something which I think is inherently wrong. It took me a long time to work this one out. He taught me that trust needed to be earned and respect needed to be earned. I think if you treat everybody who come, you come into contact with who is a potential teacher for you, and that's everybody, since you have something to learn from everybody, but you don't treat them with respect or at least show respect, they're not going to respect, trust you, and you don't have, are not giving the opportunity to learn from those people. And it was when I learned to at least act like I had respect for people in, in positions of greater authority than I had, whether or not I really respected them, but I acted like I did, I gave them the opportunity for me to learn something from them. So I would encourage all young people to not be skeptical of the people that have been placed in a position to try to teach you something. And even if you think they don't have anything to teach you, act like you think they do. And you might be surprised. You might actually learn a great deal from them. I have learned a great deal from people who I thought were very negative role models, where I said, ultimately, I don't want to ever be like that. But if I hadn't at least given them the opportunity to be who they were, I would not have been able to find out anything from them. Mm -hmm. So my piece of advice is remember you can learn something from everybody and treat people with respect and kindness. And you might be surprised what you find out from them, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And what I, what I recommend it's been, it's the only thing I know, which is just, Do the work. It's the only thing we have is to keep doing the work. Listen to music. You're not going to know how to interpret music if you don't know music. You've been called upon to be an expert of musical style from, and I'm going to throw out a completely arbitrary date, from 1685 until, or 1650, somewhere around, you know, the mid-Baroque, until yesterday or tomorrow. That's an awfully long time to have some sense of musical style. If you don't listen to great performances of great music, you're never going to know how to do that. I ask my students, what music do you like to listen to? And they say, oh, I'll listen to hip hop. I say, okay, what else do you like to listen to? Oh, I'll listen to 50s rock. Yeah, what else do you like to listen to? I like to listen to... uh, Indie rock. Yeah, what else do you like to listen to? And finally, I, they get to the point where they've never mentioned the classical music, and they're, they're bassoon players, for God's sake. <laughs> you know, where I say, hey, you know, I'm going to send you some YouTube links of some performances of, by great performance of great music. I want you to listen to it. I want you to listen to them more than once. Now, what I used to say, and this is partially how I've changed. I used to say, you want to be a bassoon player, but you never listen to classical music. Why don't you become 
wanted to play an instrument that plays the kind of music you like to listen to, then it would be meaningful to you. But I've decided that's very negative. I think that's negative teaching, and I try not to be negative. So instead, I just say, hey, why don't you listen to this? And I want you to really listen to it. And usually they, you know, they respect me enough that they'll do that. I want you to practice your scales. I want you to practice your fundamentals. I want you to, to, pract- I want you to do, try everything with all your heart that I ask you to do in our two to four years together. It says, I don't expect any of you to leave Rice University doing everything I tell you to do but you're not going to know what to take with you if you don't try it. And I mean, really give it a good try while you're here. That just makes sense to me. And if you don't want to do that, you should go study with somebody where you want to do that. I don't care. It's fine. It's not personal. So I ask you this question. When you were, have you ever practiced something 10,000 times and screwed it up on the, on the 10,000 and first time? Did you ever say something like this to you, to yourself? I am such a, you fill in the blank, something like bad human being for having done that. Mm -hmm. Oh, all the time. All the time. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I want you to try something the next time you have that emotion. Instead of saying that to yourself, I want you to say to yourself, wasn't that fascinating? Mm. Because then you've given yourself something to build on. If you just say you're a jerk or you're an asshole, it's not, you're not going to learn anything. But if you say, that was interesting, I've practiced that 500 times and I'm still messing it up, what can I learn from that? Then you're going to figure it out. It's a growth mindset. It is a growth mindset. And I, I spend a tremendous amount of time helping my students with their inner dialogue so that they're not beating themselves up and can continue to learn because you're not going to get anything from from a catastrophic mindset or a negative mindset, mm-hmm. you're not going to learn anything. And that's all any of us are trying to do is to learn something. Well, uh, Mr. Caymans, this has been a phenomenal interview. I needed to hear so much of what you said today, and I know our listeners will feel the same. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Jackie. Galit, thank you very much. And Jackie, I wanted to tell you, I did perform the Gubaitalina Concerto and had an incredible experience working on it and playing the piece. Wonderful. I'm so glad to hear it. hope you enjoyed that episode with Benjamin Caymans. Don't forget to follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. You can get our podcast anywhere you get any other podcasts, iTunes, YouTube, Google Play, Apple Podcasts. And if you wouldn't mind leaving us a review, we would very much appreciate it. Galit, who do we got coming up on the next episode? The amazing Toyin Spellman Diaz, oboist in the Imani Winds. You're not going to want to miss it. Jackie, time to end this nerd parade. Go make reads. It was really cute. You said iTunes instead of iTunes. <laughs>